piss flick. All right. Hi, well, hi, well. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you begin? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Dresner. Welcome to Blogging Heads. Uh, I'm Ezra Klein. Uh, you are with the American Prospect. I am indeed. You are with Tufts. Is that right? Yeah, the Fletcher All School. Right. That's right. Um, well, why don't we start? You just got back from vacation. I did uh, indeed. Congratulations. Uh, to segue you... Uh, no, please. Uh, uh, we can uh, make it up make some useful joke about still so having to scrap the uh, uh Condemn me for as they did last time, but uh, that, that's okay. Well, I was going <laughs> to welcome you back to the... the <laughs> it, it was amazing. Uh, I came on blog in a couple weeks ago, ago and like, I, I, had I had a shave for five days. There was a sense about facial hair. And you think... You, know, you never realize, like, people actually pay attention to these things, but if you do, this morning I, I left out and went, oh, no, I didn't shave. Be so you know what? The title for this will be non-clean shave. I didn't shave today either, so not oh, we'll not that we can really probably tell at this point. You know, given the granularity of the video and and the not necessarily robust beard that I might grow, but still, you know. So uh, a blogging scruff. Exact blogging scruff. I like that. The scruffy <laughs> scruffing heads or something. Scruffing you know, heads. Uh, exactly. Scruffy blog. Yes. All right, exactly. So um, we were going to talk about Clinton, the new Vanity Fair article that came out by the Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's a nice way to welcome you back to the Beltway. You know, of course, today's must read is the right. first piece. Oh, it's yeah. very Beltway. Um, so for folks who haven't read that, I mean, we'll, I mean, we'll put it up on the yeah, on the magic side, side, on the right side. Uh, uh, as soon as we can, I'm sure. sure. But it is a very long, very depth look and a very critical look. At Clinton in the aftermath of Bill Clinton, of, Bill Clinton. Um, yeah. Yeah. essentially Bill Clinton. I'm sorry, in the aftermath, sort of, of his wife's campaign, and it does three things I think which you really haven't seen done for a while. Number one, well, I guess they're all, all the same thing. Essentially, it goes much deeper into the insinuations and rumors around mm-hmm. his health, his fidelity, and his business dealings than than anyone else has. I say that because you know Bill Clinton is hardly an unexplored figure, but but for one reason or another, in, in the Beltway, Beltway where, uh, as Dan yeah, says, yeah, I am, I am, there are, there are every day sort of all these rumors about, you know, all of these sort of aspects of his world. But as far as I know, nobody's printing them, nobody's going out on. But Todd Perdue sort of went in and, you know, something strange is going on here. And it, it seems to me that he was on some level so sort of frustrated by, and this is sort of where the piece ends, actually, so frustrated by Clinton's self-pity and his sort of increasingly hypocritical arguments in, in the campaign. For them, felt were increasingly hypocritical. They just yeah. said, enough. Mm-hmm. And he sort of put it out. It was almost like an implicit threat that the Clinton campaign's argument has been, you know what, we're vetted. You're not going to find out anything new. We are the state candidates. You know, while Obama over there, he's got a new sort of Trinity uh, Trinity congregation video coming out every week. And for them, sort of wrote this article and said, you know, nothing's quite true. People aren't looking at it now. But there's a lot going on here that people that people haven't explored, and you know what? Frankly, they could. Okay, so let me let me then ask you. I mean, I, I read the piece, and I got my own thoughts you know what? about it. Frankly, but they could. One of the things that did strike me after finishing it was it wasn't clear to me what was new in the piece. Um, Perdun did a, he did an excellent job of sort of cataloging what what mm-hmm. essentially has been inside the Beltway gossip, and I, I you know I, I agree with you. Whenever I'm in D.C., I hear this stuff you know all the time as well. Um, you know, stuff about, although less about his health, that was actually interesting mm-hmm. to me. But it's not clear to me there was any great revelation in the story. What the story mostly consisted of was a bunch of what a lot of people already knew, but sort of all in one sort of you know, go-to article about why Bill Clinton is going to be, right. you know, difficult. But it's not clear to me that any of this is new. I mean, you could argue, I suppose, on the one hand, that the Reverend Wright stuff wasn't new either, that, you know, he'd given those sermons before, and so that might be, you know, Perdon might just be saying, look, this stuff might not be new, but we, it's, it's going to get raised if Hillary were to, you know, get the right. nomination. But, I mean, was there anything that you read in the piece that actually surprised you? I'm curious. There's a little bit. No, I, I, I think you're right a lot of that. I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would liken, liken it, it to, to the difference between knowing the mafia runs your town, having someone come into your shop and say, hey, nice shop you have here. Shame is something. I mean, what... That happens in academia all the time, I might was, add. It's not well known, but, you know, occasionally I'm sorry. working on a piece like... Hey, that's a nice piece you got there, the Democratic Peace Hypothesis. It'd be a shame if it were to be published in the wrong location, though, you know? Sure. Yeah. The, the, de- the dean comes in, sort of, <laughs> you know, absentmindedly ruffles the tweet. Um, what, what was new about it was that it was actually, I think, mm. it's different. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, you know, about, know about, about a lot of the time. I mean, I've mean, heard, heard rumors about, you know, the woman in Chappaqua, or however you say Chappaqua, that, yeah, I think. Or, yeah. I'm probably now mixing up things with Kennedy, Chappaqua. Um, I, you know, I, I've heard a lot about sort of, the association with Ding and right. the association with Burkle. And, I mean, all of it is sort of flurrying around. But aside from sort of really, 
aside from the vision stealing into a little bit in the major papers, all of it has been not, nothing. Nothing has ever gone beyond implication in the papers. And I think what doing there, and I don't know if this is really the point ended up being, but it was but sort, it was of, sort mind, of mind that people got that, that, that if it did indeed become something the media wanted to do, if the media did indeed want to ask a whole ton of questions about all the women right. Bill and seen with, about business partners he's had, about all the health things, things could get a little bit messy and grafted in the sort of characterological profile because it was this sort of enormous self-pity yes. and his tendency to forgive in himself that he would never abide in another. It, in other yeah. words, he sort of created a character of Clinton that fit with someone who was still doing of, uh, practices, activities, business dealings that could be dangerous to his position and his legacy, but also his wife's campaign and her presidency. And Perdum mm-hmm. sort of just sort of came out and said, you know what, it may be rumor, but there's so much of it that it's hard to believe there's not a big yeah. truth. Which is not to say maybe, maybe there is no truth. Maybe... Every time with purple is completely above the board, you know, I, and I have nothing to say to the to the contrary. I've never published any of this myself, but I think what Perdom was trying to do is in putting it all in one place was really creating. It wasn't just the appearance of impropriety, but the sort of the roadmap to looking into it, and just sort of saying, yeah. you know, what if they do it, it's going to be there, or probably. Well, no, there's no question. I mean, if you think about it, to date, the the, the worst. That a, a vice presidential spouse, or you know, I, I kept thinking, you know, this pretty much guarantees Hillary Clinton will not get the vice presidential nomination, if, you know, or, or that um, because you know I kept thinking in the in, right. the, in the history of vice presidential uh, nominations, John Zaccaro, Geraldine Ferraro's husband, was sort of the gold standard of ways in which right. a vice presidential spouse could fuck up a campaign, and there's no question that Bill Clinton could top that just based on what you saw in this article. And you can you can twist that around a little bit too, right? For our spouse on the screwed up campaign, he was dealing with dealing with, but he was not, he was not a, a well known local operator. Right, exactly. Another of, another of the threads running through this piece was Clinton's lack of political self control. Yeah. And the ways in which that has harmed on rights on rights candidacy and the and ways in which it has not. I mean Perdom actually took a certain applied a type of um, cardiac surgery initiated dementia has taken I have to admit, which I think is Say it before. I thought that was frankly wrong. No, there, there were moments in the in this piece where I winced because it was very yeah. clear that what Perdum was trying to do yeah. was say, you know, X happened. X is associated with Y. Therefore, Y must have happened to Clinton. And I'm like, right. you know, you're just stretching it a little too much there. Clinton's not been running around. I mean, uh, uh, in the snows of Iowa in his underwear. I mean, the guy has made a couple sort of, uh, you know, over over self pitying or over angry comments yeah. in a political campaign. I mean he is, he's not been striking as somebody who's over the financial but he has struck me struck me and as some of them has not always been always well, think, to shut up. Yeah. I think that was really in evidence in South Carolina mm-hmm. and elsewhere. And I think that another of the things that you know, to, to talk about the yeah. unity ticket just for a second that Obama would have to consider is not only sort of the way Clinton, which is a bit poisonous and, and all the associated there, but does he really believe he can control Bill Clinton? Mark Penn, Howard Wilson, Harold Ickes. I mean, does he believe that a machine as sort of the dominant as a Clinton machine can yeah. ever effectively play the subordinate role? And that, to me, has always, has always looked like the greatest uh, impediment to the unity ticket. The simple fact that I, I just can't imagine anyone convincing Obama or Obama convincing himself that having this machine beneath his own sort of newer operation mm-hmm. and given the way this machine is sort of uh, appeared to feel that you know, his uh, his candidacy is fairly presumptuous, mm-hmm. that he would be able to control, keep leaks from happening, they disagreed with him, oh, yeah. you know, keep everything in line. It, it seems very impossible. No, 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 it's, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, I think the quote that I, I found in the Perdome piece that I think was mo- the best explanation for why Clinton has acted the way he has, I mean, I, I agree, I don't think it's dementia or anything like that. Mike McCurry um, said something to the effect of, look, you've got to remember that this guy, the last time this guy was involved in a national campaign was more than 10 years ago. It was 96. It was his re-election campaign. And as, as McCurry said, which I thought was quite, you know, death, he essentially ran out of post. I mean, Dole never seriously threatened Clinton in that election. So, you know, really, you got to go back to 92. And, you know, the, his first and only national campaign, the one where, we, where he really had to fight. And what's amazing is, you know, in some ways I think politics is just like sports, which is if you get out of the game for a while and then you try to re-enter it, you lose the instincts, you lose the muscle memory, and furthermore, it's in some ways more difficult because the game changes while you're gone. You know, Clinton, you know, you know, Bill Clinton never had to deal with blogs, 
you know, he never had to deal with with a whole variety of media that now are, you know, sort of dominate or, or not dominate, but certainly influence uh, the race. And so I think that's partially what's going on is that he thinks that he, you know, he someone who was if it, once at the top of their game, it's very difficult, it strikes me, for them to realize that they need to retool. And particularly someone like Clinton who – it's almost impossible for him to blame himself for any kind of predicament he gets himself into. It, it's doubly difficult. Um, uh, and then one last uh, point, I think I would. Agree, I think you said this earlier, but I, I'd reemphasize this. I think the interesting thing you're right is the fact that this piece got published at all. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it was it Joshua Green that was going to publish a piece about Hillary that got killed by a major magazine? I'm trying to. Remember. It was a GQ My, piece, and I forgot yes. exactly. I mean, it was something in order to way around. It was yeah to publish a Hillary Clinton piece. If they wanted to the build the build yeah. man of the year for Right, exactly. But the point is that it, then, you know, this is like, you know, almost a year ago now, I think, the Clintons held enough sway and enough, you know, influence over the right. media that they could basically issue that threat. And while there was clearly grumbling, GQ backed down. I don't know, right. you know, what – my guess is, is that, that Vanity Fair never contacted, uh, you know, the Clintons in advance of this. Uh, but even if they did, my guess is they were perfectly happy to publish this piece regardless. Right. I, I think that's true. I'm going to say another thing. It's two things, actually. One is that I, I love, I love the article as Wire fan. fan. The game, the game changed. Because, like, what kept running through my <laughs> the game ain't changed, or it just got more fierce. Like, that, that's true a little bit. But I think that, look, clearly a very skilled politician. Yeah. He gives a gorgeous speech. He's, you know, runs some very impressive campaigns. But... I think that the Clinton, the, the sort of much vaunted Clinton political instincts have always been a bit oversold. He's a guy who's very good at getting himself elected, but he's not actually been very good at getting yeah. other people elected. I mean, if you look at, you know, there are a lot of forces going on here, realignments and this and that, but, but you know, if you just look at it, I mean, Congress, when Clinton came into power, at one set and left, way more yeah. Republican. Although I- way more Republican. I mean, did Gore win? Yeah, I mean, Gore sort of won. Uh, he got a bit more of the popular vote. But after a sort of economic record like that, or to try to navigate the Clinton legacy, did he, did he won by so little that, you know, it was almost hardly a win at all? I mean, one would have imagined after eight years of economic growth like that, yeah. eight years of peace and prosperity like that, he would have had that by four or five. Oh, yeah. And, see, you can sort of go on down the line. I mean, I'm not blaming Clinton for all of it, but... Well, I was going to say, I mean, look, I, I, I push back a little bit on this sure. in, in three ways. The first is, I mean, you're right, you know, that, that, that clearly in, the, in, the, in Congress, Clinton was not helpful for the Democrats. On the other hand, that was 40 years of institutional legacies. I mean, just as, you know, there were scandals in 2006 in Congress, mm-hmm. um, what was the guy's name? I, I, it's amazing, you can't remember his yeah, name now. Yeah, Nowski, who you're thinking of? Uh, the Florida one, you know, the Florida sex uh, oh, Florida um, congressman. Uh, the Page guy. Yeah, yeah, and oh, I can't man. remember his name. That's yeah, amazing. Okay. That's awful. God, I, I apologize to the, the, the viewers. Anyway, but the point is there were a series of small congressional scandals that led to the, the switch Mark, in, Mark in 2000. Mark Fultz. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I kept wanting to say Mark Rich for some reason. And then, you know, uh, I mean, those I things happened in 94 as well. There was that House. Yes, that's right. Uh, but, I mean, the point is there were, there were, there were House scandals as well. I mean, I remember the sure. banking scandal that took place in the early 90s. In other words, Clinton wasn't solely responsible for that. The second is is that I mean Al Gore's failure to uh-huh. win convincingly in 2000 I think had a lot more to do with Al Gore than with uh, with Bill Clinton. Admittedly, Clinton didn't make things terribly easy, but Gore managed. And you know, if you ever talk, talk to an ex Gore staffer, they'll confirm this. You know, it never was a situation a simple situation in which Al Gore couldn't make it more complex, um, and that was part of it. Right. I mean, I just yeah yeah. I, I think there are arguments on both sides of that, right? I, I I grant everything you say there, man. I'm not trying to lay it all to its feet. On the other hand, Clinton created a series of very, very tough conditions for any Democrat to run in. I mean, you look at what the yeah, Nazi yeah, scandals yeah. have and all of that. But Clinton had also massively missed. No, there's no question. I mean, no they, question. You know, just well, the days in the military, he, they were stonewalling on white weather, yeah. which, you know, I understand why, but it didn't end up being yeah. a good idea. You know, their relations with the press were, for better or worse, very, very poor. It was, you know, a, a yeah. real problem yeah, for yeah. everyone. <laughs> You know, and, and I'm not uh, defending Gore's sort of campaigning attitude, but just my point is that Clinton's always been a very good sort of individual politics and yeah. back is against the wall. But political victories have not been remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. One in the 90s, you have the fall of the Civil War, off the table. You have an intense recession and a third-party challenge from a populist right-wing standpoint to 
push mm-hmm. and then it comes through with, you know, a, a fair margin and nothing unbelievable. Yeah. And then in 96, you know, you have an unreal economy, one of the best we've had, you know, in that entire, and, you know, Dole, who, you know, is a problematic uh, candidate on his own, and again, Perot sort of lashing the Republicans, and, you know, right. so he wins again, but I just don't think if you look at the sort of way he left even, even in 96, you're right, I mean, even in 96, he didn't get more than he half did, He didn't get a majority. He didn't get a majority either yeah. time. Um, which, yeah, you know, George yeah. W. Bush, for better words, he did. Now, Perot was in there. He was in there this time. Nader came up. I mean, Clint so much at Nader. Why Nader had any sort of salience in 2000 yeah. at all. I'm not trying to lay it all at his feet. My only point is that there was a sort of tendency, I think, to believe him a political genius and master sort of strategist on a macro level himself to be. He's very, very good at really winning elections. No doubt, no doubt about it. But he's not proven, proven able to pull out any election for um, anyone. He's not, he's not been proven to be a, a mad... Uh, an ace for anyone else, for he's, he other doesn't have co struggling in elections. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I, I'll, I'll push back in two ways, I guess. It, the first is that the other way in which Clinton is judged is, is partially his policy successes. I mean, it's easy to point to health care as, as a big disaster, but if you rack up what Clinton did accomplish, both in terms of Congress and more generally, you know, it's not an immodest set of, contra- you know, of, of, of policy uh, uh, successes. You know, macroeconomic stability, uh, passage of NAFTA, that he wouldn't want to claim credit for that now, but certainly that was a significant policy victory. The Uruguay round in terms of trade, um, you know, welfare reform. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think, you know. But I think if you look at those policy victories, I mean, yeah. for better or worse, and we can argue about NAFTA, and, and I basically support them, but they aren't policy victories that made it really easy for Democrats to win elections. That's the, a fair, the, no, no, the no, that's a fair point. The budget that that. did not make it easy yeah. for Democrats. NAFTA did not make it easy for yeah. Democrats to split the base. NAFTA, NAFTA split labor. And, and again, again, these are these things where were clearly able to build itself out yeah. yeah. the fairly difficult presidency, but not sort of strengthen right. the party. These were not things that expanded yeah. the Democratic coalition. They are not things that made no, 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 the Democrats. That's fair. I mean, and I, I do agree. I mean, I think part of the reason Clinton is seen as such a master tactician is, is you know, politics is a, is a relative, it's a zero-sum game. So it was always Clinton versus whoever was opposing him, and, and God, he had the gift of just really moronic enemies most of the time. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, Newt Gingrich, who managed to, ma- who, you know, it, it's very rare when, when Bill Clinton looks like the le- less petty individual, <laughs> um, and yet Newt Gingrich managed to pull this off. Um, and then, you know, all the, the sort of right way, you know, the, 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 the impeachment efforts and all, all, all that stuff. You know, Clinton always managed to look like the bigger man, actually. Right. Um, but again, I think this had more to do with the, the ineptitude of his, his, his adversaries than anything else. And I think in some ways, you know, the, when we look at the campaign now, Hillary Clinton in some ways run a more disciplined campaign than, than Bill Clinton oh, sure. ever did. It's just, that, it's just that Hillary Clinton is also run against much tougher political competition than tougher Bill Clinton ever faced. Think about how foreign policy was off the table in 92. Well, foreign policy was her greatest weakness in 2008. I mean, some of this stuff is much more complicated um, for her than it ever was for him. And, you know, it, it, she just, yeah. you know, and uh, but it, they've always been blessed with good enemies before. Obama's not an easy enemy. And they've tried to treat him like one, and that, I think, has been one of their, trying to sort of, yeah, no, Obama's but, trying to steal an election, or, you know, yeah, uh, Bill Clinton think he's not prepared to be president. I mean, these are pretty hard attacks right here. And when, and they work really well when you're dealing with Newt Gingrich, who always yeah, no, I agree. hate, and they work a lot less well when you're dealing with sort of of both the Democratic and media, mm-hmm. darling, media darling, like Obama. I'm not, I'm not saying, saying that Aaron Obama, Obama, Obama was in that easy to ride or ride the here. here. But these were, at the same time, fairly large strategic miscalculations they made. Yeah, no, I mean, let, let, Barack Obama is clearly the most gifted politician that either of them has had to face in the last 20 years. Sure. Um, and I think that's the way you have to look You're at it. You're not impressed by Paul, Paul. Shockingly, no, no. Uh, <laughs> A fine, a fine individual, sure. a, a gifted politician, not not so much. No, um, so uh, so yeah. I mean, in that sense, that's I, I think that's what's going on, and I think they were. You're right. I think they've grown more and more mystified and more frustrated as every tactic they've they've thrown every tactic in the book out at him, and most of them have either backfired or polarized. Right. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party, and so it's ama- You know, you're right. In some ways. The game, ha- I, I agree. I think the game has changed, and it's it's left them. I think we we'll uh, left that be left that be the word on this, but basically everything you said there. Yes. And moving on, were we doing public intellectuals next, or were we? No, I, I, I had to participate in a conference that uh, at uh, Peter Berger's shop at Boston University on public intellectuals, and so I was asked to write a paper about you know public intellectuals in the electronic age, you know, in the age of blogs and so on and so forth. And you know, reading, you know, doing the the, the research for this paper, what struck me is that. You know, if you if you see what most people say about public intellectuals now, the overwhelming 
meme is or, or you know theme is that it's one of decline. They they ain't what you they used to be. And you know the only debate is really when sure. when was the moment of decline started? For some it's the 50s, for some it's the 30s, for some it's John Stuart Mill, and for a small group it's the death of Socrates. You know that that you know it, it's all been downhill <laughs> since then. And you know I, I think Ezra, you you posted once or twice uh, you know similar kinds of notes about this. I mean when uh-huh. when William F. Buckley died, and I I, I think you've had one or two others. Uh, post on this. When Galbraith died, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, and I think that part of this is the passing of that '50s uh-huh. generation of public intellectuals. And I think my take is that you know, I I, I think this is sort of a, a thing of hindsight bias, where it is ridiculously easy to look back 50 years and sort of look at the greatest works of public intellectuals in their day and say, "Wow, that's great. What do we have now? It, it doesn't seem to, to come close." When in fact, there was an awful lot of crap written in the '50s as well. And that sort of, you know, fades from view um, is one thing. And so, so I, I actually, I will be willing to defend today's public intellectuals up against, you know, previous generations. And the other thing that I think is true is that, is that blogs and the mm-hmm. Internet more generally can actually aid in the, the sort of flowering of public intellectuals in the, in the following sense that, you know, the, both Russell Jacoby and Richard Posner have written about why public intellectuals today ain't what they used to be. Jacoby argues it's because, they, they both argue it's because, well, Public intellectuals mostly come from the academy now, and the academy has become so professionalized that these people can only write to each other. They can't write to a more general audience. Um, I think what what the Internet and what blogs in particular do is they make it much easier for academics and for others to sort of enter the public sphere Mm -hmm. and be able to actually engage in, in public discourse. And also, in an added benefit, criticize the living hell out of other public intellectuals who make asses out of themselves. Uh, this is an a underutilized or an underappreciated feature, I think, of the mm-hmm. blogosphere. Um, and as a result, it's not that every academic then, therefore becomes a public intellectual. It's more that if an academic wants to be a public intellectual, it's much easier to, to, to break through that ceiling than it was when you needed to get the approval of an editor of the New York Times or the Atlantic Monthly to publish. Um, and as a result, this creates, you know, I think, useful inter- – it does two things. First – it creates a way in which someone can become a public intellectual without becoming an academic, um, which is increasingly magazines are now, you know, you're one example of this, you know, hiring bloggers or people, you know, uh, to be in-house bloggers. And I think that is a useful public intellectual role. And the second is, is that I think it allows academics to talk to each other beyond their own discipline. You know, when I'm, as a blogger, I don't, I'm not just talking to other political scientists. I'm also talking to economists, to sociologists. You know, and that, the more broad my conversation, the better, you know, someone can be as a public intellectual, I guess. I think all that is um, largely true. I mean, I think that there are a couple issues that are getting a little bit okay. conflated, though. I think one I think is one question of the which you, which you spend a lot, spend a lot of time, and I agree with you. I mean, all uh, I, I think folks today are as smart and as learned as they were, you know, yeah. yesterday. Um, the point I tended to make on Galbraith and, and you know Friedman and, and Buckley and so forth is that it's a little bit different. It's not that we have fewer public intellectuals, but the people buying the sort of top lost in the in the media ecosphere. Yeah. The, the sort of top I think at one time were people at least had these intellectual pretensions. And now they're I think largely people who right. are campaign reporters. And, and that's only to say that I think that the path to um, the path to prominence in punditry has has changed. You know, it used to be that you had a that only had a couple of hours of news on a day. Yeah. And then you had some newspapers and you had some magazines and the people were chosen by those sort of gatekeepers, were the people who were our sort of public inter- political public intellectuals of the day. And it happened to be that Galbraith was one of them, um, mm-hmm. and it happened to be the Friedman and Buckley, and I, I think that there was something to that. And so they sold millions and millions of copies of their books, and, and Galbraith didn't think, but, you know, it's really hard for me to imagine, imagine things like, like, like the Apple Society, Society or the New Industrial Society coming out and selling a whole ton of copies. All right, but all right, now here's the other question. What about free economics? Um, which does not have the same political message, un- undeniably, that those other books have. But, I mean, I would argue Freakonomics probably has sold as much as those other books. But I would argue Freakonomics is very different than those other books. I mean, uh, I okay. think that – I'm trying to think of what – like, I read a lot of books on political economy, but, like, I wouldn't mm-hmm. put Freakonomics in there. I mean, Freakonomics strikes me as, you know, a popular work, of, almost a work of popular science. But, again, it's not to denigrate um, – I mean, also, Levitt and, and Dubner are not sort of political intellectuals. You know, I think that the role played by Galbraith and Friedman and so forth that one being played by people like Coulter and Chris Matthews because as it turned out they actually were more popular. And when you had sort of more competition, what turned out to happen is that 
there were a couple gatekeepers, some of them at Fox News, some of them at Regnery, some of them um, at Time Magazine and Newsweek, who said, turns out that, um, you know, the way to get market share is not necessarily the sort of wittiest guys, but, you know, just hire some of the more bombastic. And so things went in. That isn't to say that um, there aren't as many or more sort of brilliant, uh, publicly oriented intellectuals. But to say that any individual right, is, think, has a smaller right, audience, and, I'm, and there are a lot of arguments that that is a good thing, yeah. and, and I'm not even really sure where I come down on that, but I think it is a very different sort of media sphere that you have then. I think that the people don't look, I can't think of who the sort of writers and authors are that people look to for cues in the way that, it really does seem to me the conservative movement looked to Buckley. It really does seem to me that um, Galbraith decides to roll on the Democratic side, Friedman. I don't know who the sort of Tributes are that exist well, today, say, and maybe that's actually a better thing. Um, and I, I agree with you on blogging and so forth. By the way, the one thing that is true is that you know a couple notches below sort of world historic figures yeah. who get a, a page in New York Times when they die. There's certainly the opportunity for many, many, many more sort of intelligent, learned people right. to take their learning into the public sphere. And I think that we've actually had a, a, a rough moment where there were gatekeepers mm-hmm. who were too focused on the profit motive. And so you had, so you had Matthews and Colbert and them just sort of arise and there was no challenge. And I don't actually mean to equate Matthews and Colbert. I sort of like Matthews and has been on the show. But um, to say that there was a moment when it, what you had was, you know, gatekeepers, but more of them, and they're both mm-hmm. intermediate competition. And so they brought up a lot of people who get high ratings. And now you have a lot of people. And though, you know, though blogs are still more niche than, you know, yeah. MSNBC or CNN, they have allowed people like Tyler Cohen, like Daniel Dresner, um, and, and many others to sort of come up and play this role in a fairly influential way without having to get the green light from Time, Newsweek, the producers at uh, Fox News, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I think there's a couple things I would say. I, I, on the one hand, I, I agree with you, particularly when it comes to television. I think this applies much more in television than anything else. I which agree is, with that. You're, you're right. In, in the old days, you had you know three networks plus PBS, and because it was an oligopoly, um, it was much easier for gatekeepers to say, well, let's put this guy on and this guy on without worrying about com- competing for ratings or anything like that. So mm-hmm. I, I do agree that in the television world, what you're saying is probably true, that you've got more people who are, you know, you, you have, you know, what would be considered intellectuals potentially supplanted by, you know, partisans on either side who, you know, are entertaining to, to read. Although even there, I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Doris Kearns Goodwin still does meet the press, and, and you know, Michael Beschloss, Still does these th- you know these things as well. I mean they haven't they're not extinct. They're just much mm-hmm. less visible. Um, on the print side, I'm not sure I agree with you. I mean you know you're asking who would you know look you know you look to as a as a keystone for for liberal not orthodoxy but you know sort of liberal perspective. I mean how is Paul Krugman today different from John Kenneth Galbraith 30 years ago? I mean it's, I was actually thinking about Paul when I when I made that comment and yeah. You know, I could be, I, I, it's possible I'm wrong. I mean, I, I take seriously what you said about hindsight bias, and I, I take seriously the fact that we may be misremembered the biography of Galbraith. You know, maybe it's different, but I get the feeling, sort of commentator role that Krugman is in, what he thinks of sort of the Democratic Party, is different from the sort of idea generation role that um, which was, was sort, of, sort of, in many in ways, ways, not directing, not directing but, but having a whole lot of influence on the direction of, of the Democratic Party. I mean, Krugman is in, but not of. He's, he's sort of, you know... Well, no, I mean, if, if anything, that's... you could argue this primary season was evidence of Krugman's weakness because, I mean, he first backed Edwards and then Clinton and clearly hasn't done that much. Uh, well, but even... I don't think Galbraith could have decided... Yeah, if, I remember, if I remember, Galbraith was... Yeah, yeah. Steve yeah. Yeah. and I remember, and I don't think that won. But I just mean that Galbraith, the affluent society stuff, I mean, what he did has sort of, it seemed to me, a little bit more of a role of... Um, I'm trying to think even who... It, it was really... I mean, he was, in a way, speaking for liberalism, in a way I don't think Krugman is. I think Krugman is um, a very high-profile sort of, you know, economic commentator speaking about politics. And I recognize that the distinction I'm drawing here is blurry, and maybe it's wrong, frankly. I, I'm, I can't yeah. – I wish I could say that I was so sure that I was right on how Galbraith interacted with the 50s. That, But Galbraith's relevance with Kennedy, with Johnson, with um, – uh, frankly, with the FDR people – uh, I, I think it's really different than Krugman, who really is sort of just a, a New York Times commentator and not, you know, when Galbraith came together to help form the, the Americans for Democratic Action, it's just not something that Krugman's doing today. Galbraith was a figure in a way that Krugman isn't, and maybe that's better. Uh, I, I'm not saying it isn't, but I think it is different. Right. I, mean, this is, I don't think anybody's playing that role. Yeah. I don't know who the leading sort of 
democratic economic mind is. I think Krugman is a leading liberal economic commentator, but actually, or actually, no, you're, I think you're correct in the sense that there. I mean, there are people I think you could name that might fulfill that role of Galbraith. You're talking about. I mean, you know, Jacob Hacker, for example. Even though he's a political scientist, this whole notion of the shift in political risk, I think, is a theme that that you know resonated among Democrats. And you can even argue in terms of institution building, and someone like Josh Marshall, for that matter. I mean, Talking Points Memo is a you know it's a quality shop, and it's clearly you know democratic. Um, although you know, again, you might argue that Marshall on the idea side is not quite you know the same level of, of Galbraith. You know, although we could debate uh, the correctness of Galbraith's ideas. But I mean, I, I think I'll. I'll I'll take your point on that, but I mean, I guess I would agree with you, and I think this was the response I wrote when you when right. you said this was, you know, I'm not sure how much you want mega public intellectuals to really exist. I mean, I actually think it's nice if it might be a good thing if public intellectuals have a more modest role in the sense of they don't drift too far from their area of expertise, um, because that's when they're much more likely to be wrong in, in some ways. That, you know, and, and this is the interesting dance I think that, or, or the tension that exists in terms of what a good public intellectual is supposed to do. On the one hand, they are supposed to argue, presumably, from a source of authority, from a, from a source of, I have expertise in at least some areas, so therefore that qualifies me to comment on others. But presumably their value added is that they talk in a way that is accessible to the general you know, voter, as well as presumably coming at a topic mm -hmm. you know, from an area slightly different from the experts in that area. So they can say, well, I'm thinking about it this way. Maybe this is a better way to think about it. Um, and, you know, the best public intellectuals presumably have actually done that, that, you know, Galbraith thought about, you know, society, thought about economics from a more sociological perspective, for example. Um, or, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, Friedman, well, no, Friedman, I don't know if it works for Friedman, I'm trying to think of other, you know, like Irving Howe, for example, um, is a public intellectual who, you know, looked at politics from a literary perspective. Um, so, you know, the, the, the really good ones are able to do that. And I'm not sure, I mean, I think there are a couple that still do that now. But on the other hand, I do think it, it prevents the, the really stupid errors that public intellectuals can make when they start pontificating on things that they just sound bad at. And actually, this is a, this is a nice segue. Um, well, I'll let you finish. This is an interesting segue to that New York Times uh, book review thing, but go ahead. Well, I'll give you political science first, because I think it is. But okay. I'd say that the Iraq war is evidence. You know, you actually do end up having a lot of public intellectuals who know nothing about their subject. Um, and I, yeah. I think that came out. Economics, I think, is sort of the, the I would argue, like, the Wall Street yeah. Journal, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal. I think you're fine. Point. Point. And, and I'd even go a step beyond, say, point that, look, well, that's how it was in the 50s. It isn't, I mean, on in the aggregate, we, no. to say that it has changed, of course it's going to change, okay, that. And would I take the sort of current of low barrier of entry and so forth over? Well, I would. I, I definitely would. I mean, and not only just because my career has <laughs> depended on it. And I think that a lot of my, a lot of what does bring me is television, which remains immensely powerful, and I think it's really gone down, uh, no pun intended, the tube. But that is sort of just going to be what it's going to be, and, you know, now that there's sort of more competition and more sort of academic, I think that is a, a real, uh, a real positive good. Yeah. And particularly because I, I'm hoping that over time it'll begin to feed itself, you know, that it, it would it would have been hard to find, you know, sort of good academics on a lot of these issues before. But, you know, with the blogs, it becomes much simpler to know who you can seek out for commentary on economics matters, on yeah. sort of Middle East matters, on and on and on. No, I think it does get uh, – sorry, go on. Well, just a closing mm -hmm. note on this. I mean, two things. First, I think you're right that one of the utilities of the blogosphere is mm -hmm. that basically it expands the editor's Rolodex. That, you know, for editors and reporters that are interested in writing about something – Blogs allow them to say, "Oh, this guy actually knows something about this, or this per you know this woman knows something about this," in a way that would not exist without it. Um, and, it and, and second, one last point, right. I would, you know, I would make, which is to remember that there, you know, the Ann Coulters and Bill O'Reillys and Michael Moores of the world existed in the '50s. We just don't think of them as much now. I mean, Walter Winchell, right. you know, was kind of, you know, you did kind of serve this role back then. Colson, who is the sort of anti-Semitic radio host? Uh, Father, Father right? Coughlin. Well, that was the 30s, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So the point is that these people did, yeah. did it also existed back then. It's just thankfully we don't, you know, they, their legacy is not quite as uh, as impressive as let's say Irving House. And, and I, um, um, if you go if to, to, right. to, 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 to think about it, 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 public intellectuals who don't stray okay. far from the area of expertise. You know, you wanted that post I wrote a while ago. You being a political scientist, me being a former political science student, on why I didn't like the major, and in part it was because of that that. There was a feeling 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm going to take it to a blogosphere, for example, because I think that maybe it can make the point better. I think that if you compare the role of economists and political scientists in the blogosphere, yeah. something is really askew. I mean, you would think that you would have just a a massive influx of political scientists, high-profile ones at this point, you know, good writers who are really sort of pushing the best sort of um, research from the day to inject into political, mm-hmm. political conversation, trying to make these arguments. The only one, I mean, you know, you, you do wonderful work in, in your expertise, but the only ones I can think of doing a sort of generalized um, version of that are the folks over at the Monkey Cage. They're a brand new blog. I mean, they, they can't be half a year old. Feeling for me when I was sort of in that discipline, it was also sort of blogging, writing, and trying to think it all through. That in the effort to make it feel like a real science, there was an allergy to letting it yeah. get involved in real politics. And so, what they taught was not often relevant. Uh, students wanted to practice, do, learn about, and, and I just felt sort of over and over and over again that though there was certainly all this sort of wonderful research, which really would have provided an empirical backing to things I wanted mm-hmm. to understand and know about. There was, at the same time, a sort of uh, an almost aggressive effort to keep it pretty bloodless and keep it from making too many pronouncements or sort of involved in the battles of the Well, economists, I think, tend to sort of, even in ways I think are unhealthy, you know, wander, wander into battle with sort of full yeah. armor on. And, like, you know, are constantly sort of invading this protectionism and a shadow of a, of a flicker of a mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I think that actually makes them much more useful. I mean, I, I've, I've learned a whole ton about economics since becoming a blogger. I've learned much less about political science, even though I've actually, tr- you know, I've reached out to political scientists, I've, I've asked people to start a blog, to go to the monkey cage, to post to say it's in part a blog about something, I, you know, in re- response to a request, I made a blog like that. But I can't figure out why political scientists don't sort of demand a larger role, really work to propagate the insights of the profession. I mean, the reason I didn't like it, um, I didn't feel like it was... It wasn't political enough. ...enough about how to yeah. look at politics. Yeah, I mean... No, this is the dirty that. secret about political science. I mean, I, w- I will agree with you about this. That you know, one one of the things that I always have to push back against by conservatives who argue, oh, all political science, you know, all social scientists are liberal, you know, or liberal lefties, and they're going to impart this in the in the uh, in their classrooms. And I always have to say, you know, there's actually not a lot of politics when people teach political science, and that you know, um, right. and that's be- I, I think part of that is because. You know, again, just the way these things get professionalized is that, you know, you, you're, you're only supposed to teach what you absolutely know as opposed to presumably um, things that, that are more speculative hypotheses. Although there's a way you teach that as well. I mean, you know, the way I always teach stuff, you know, in terms of, of policy is I'll say, look, what do we do about a problem? Well, here's one possible solution. Of course, these are the critiques of that. Here's another possibility. Here's the critiques of it. Mm-hmm. I think that the difference between potentially political scientists and economists is twofold. The first is political scientists are much more loath to say this is the right way to do mm-hmm. things. Um, in part, and, and partially that's because we're less right. sure about that than economists are. Um, you know, econ- there is a consensus. You know, if you poll economists, the consensus about trade, for example, is pretty strong. It's slightly eroded recently, but it's, it's relatively strong. You know, the consensus about you know other issues are again relatively. You know, well founded. That is, there there is a certain set of principles where all economists would agree. Yes, this is probably a bad way to go about policy. Political science, on the other hand, is a little trickier in that way because there's, I mean, you know, in terms of international relations, for example, there was, you know, there's less consensus about certain things. Although I would add that actually most, I was in the minority. Most IR scholars vigorously opposed the right. war in Iraq, for example, thinking that it would be a disaster. Um, and certainly that you know they were they were born out there. Um, you know that that there are fewer sort of areas of consensus I think for political scientists. And part of that is also the the subject area that political science studies now, which is frequently what you know let's say in, within American political right. science, the study is almost predominantly Congress and legislatures. And it's more how does the institutional organization of Congress affect what the outcome of Congress you know outputs of Congress will be. There is it is much rarer. Um, I agree with you on this. For political scientists to to come in and say, "Hey, you know what? We've got all these tools of political science. Let's actually figure mm-hmm. out how to solve a policy problem." Um, you know, I, I, I think there are examples. I mean, Jacob Hacker has done this. You know, uh, on the left. I think Terry Moe, mm-hmm. for example, has written a lot of stuff on school choice on the right. Um, but it, it is much rarer. I agree with you on that. Um, I think part of the answer might be that. You know, again, it, it, partly for political scientists is this break between sort of normative analysis versus positive analysis. That most political scientists would justify this by saying, "Look, 
In order to understand how you want to change policy, you first have to understand the way things are and why the way things are. And so, you know, if you want to try right. to change them, you've got to know what constraints you're going to run up against. The problem with that, in some ways, is that, you know, if a political scientist has done their job on a student, the student might have, you know, next to no hope because you realize the awesome tyranny of the status quo that, that occurs with most policy out there. Um, and, I mean, that's certainly, you know, that, I right. drum that into my students when I teach them about statecraft. I say the status quo is a reason, for, you know, it, the status quo is the status quo for a lot of reasons. Some of them are very good. Some of them are bad. The point is they're all really formidable. Yeah, I, and I agree with that, and I'll give the scientists a sign this is sort of too. One, one reason that e could, e could even be sort of more immediately mm -hmm. applicable is that it gives you a, a fair number of sort of analytical formulas with, with which to understand the world. So who is, who is maximizing your utility yeah, yeah. in this situation? Where is the relevant scarcity? I mean, there are, there are certain ways in which economists look at things that you yeah. can just sort of apply it. And though it isn't always correct, it is it's a nice always universal, powerful, it, and it's very it's a universal paradigm. Yeah. Well, political yeah. science is, yeah. Uh, well, political science is a lot more, here's a paper, here's a paper, here's a paper, here's a paper, here's a paper. It, it isn't quite so much about three. And you, you will be better at policy. Well, I, mean, I, I, mean, I wouldn't go quite that far. I mean, there are theories. In, I mean, yeah, rational choice approaches to political science or public choice approaches to political science. Oddly enough, I've got very little. I, I agree with you, but... I got very little exposure to rational choice or public choice in, in my program. Really? Actually, none. You were UCLA, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I've got to have a word with the UCLA poli sci about that. Well, Santa Cruz and UCLA, and Santa Cruz I heard a little bit more ah. about neo-Marxism than one might imagine. <laughs> yes. But I got very little public choice. I mean, it, it was surprising to me in that way. I mean, the other point I make, by the way, as your students, and I'm, I'm sure you're an excellent teacher, I agree with that, by the way. The yeah. importance of political economy, to me, cannot be overstated. It's like, yeah. that is sort of what I try and focus on in my work now. But it is also something I was not given a good ground. And part of that is that there are classes I could have taken, which would have taught me about public choice, rational choice, political economy, I'm sure. You just chose well, this not is to. Well, I chose not to. I didn't know which ones to take. I wasn't sophisticated yeah. about them. But um, it, it's not well, all repeated from course to course. If you, you, may, you wouldn't go into yeah. an economics course, and economics 101 is just not corrupting. But you do want to do a lot of political science, 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 science where, where those, are, those just don't involve, don't get involved, you know? No, um, and this, again, this is where, I, I, again, another area in which economics curriculum will be different from a political science curriculum is that if you're an undergraduate major in economics, the courses right. are cumulative, which is, you know, you, you take the intro course, then you will teach intermediate, micro, and macro, for example. And, you know, by the time you're a senior, they're building on these blocks that you presumably learned from former, you know, from prior coursework. Right. It is less cumulative in political science, and partly that's because actually political science is a more heterodox field. Um, that you have rational mm -hmm. choice people, you also still have Marxists in the field. Obviously, um, you right. know you have in the international relations realists, you have uh, institutionalists, you have constructivists. So I mean, partly it's be, it's because there there are more paradigm wars, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it, in political science than there is in in economics, and this can lead to. You know, what can seem like – I can understand why undergraduates, you know, can finish the major and be, oh, wait a minute, I'm not sure I right. learned anything of value. And I, I will say, just to hit on to, – to, to throw a little crap the undergraduates' way, I think part of this also, though, is that presumably most economics majors are not afraid of math in a way that political science uh -huh. majors are. And that, you know, some of the better modeling work done in political science obviously requires a comfort level with math that – all political science majors might not necessarily right. and, and I would I wouldn't deny that. I am less comfortable with math than I than I wish I were. But this does get to a good thing, uh, a good sort of segue because for the political science yeah. before and even for politicians, politicians did so, did so. Did so the New York Times, New York Times had a speech about um, recommending yeah. books to the presidential candidates. And frankly I thought most of the recommendations they got were pretty I thought they sucked. No, except I agree. for Gore Vidal. I, I, we, except for Vidal who wrote right, we uh, on this, yes. said. Corbett Dawford told the New York Times, I only have a negative. I recommend they do not read the New York Times and instead read the Financial Times. <laughs> Which, you know, if I were, if I'm the Financial Times, I immediately put that on the masthead for Gore Vidal. You know, oh, totally. That's, uh, um, you know, if you're the FT, you got to love that. But, yeah, I agree. Beyond Gore Vidal, I thought almost all the rest of them were were just banal. It was very surprising. Banal, juvenile. I mean, it was really bad. But you had a couple that I thought made some sense, and then I chimed in with a few of my own. Yeah. So, well, why don't we close on that? What do you think the presidential candidates need to read? Well, I think the single most important book I would actually, or the, the single book I would recommend, um, is David Stockman's *The Triumph mm -hmm. of Politics*, um, because 
Stockman's book is basically the classic narrative of Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you know, full of bright ideas about how they're going to, you know, cut the government, you know, and cut taxes. And, you know, it's, a, it's this slow dawning on Stockman that he made, you know, a number of small missteps along the way, winds up being very successful at cutting taxes and discovers that he can't cut the budget. Um, and by the end, you know, he sort of bemoans the fact that, um, you know, he's created this unbelievably ballooning budget deficit, you know, from ideas that he thought if they had been worked out in theory would have been successful. But, you know, they just meet this brick wall of, you know, bureaucratic infighting and congressional resistance and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So I, I think that was actually the most important book. A couple of the others I recommended um, were uh, James Surowiecki's The Wisdom of Crowds, um, just because, again, I think as – as president, the natural inclination of a president is to is to centralize because presumably that's what they can do. And one of the things I like about the wisdom of crowds is that it points out that occasionally the masses actually can, uh, you know, uh, come to come to a, a the right conclusion on their own. I, I've had insight with wisdom of crowds. I've had insight with wisdom of crowds. It's also very feedback effects. It's very good on sort of explaining the easy, no, careful I, way you're yes, coming I, I, from. I, I, just a that, second. I mean. Soroki is also good in pointing out, look, there are areas where, in fact, expertise does trump the wisdom of crowds. And, and so I actually thought it was useful to point out, look, you know, not, you don't want to rely on the wisdom of crowds every time. But there are times where they are right, and then there, there are other times where you do want expertise to presumably come in and help influence the decision. So, But I actually always thought that that book was, if you want to understand what happened in the media and the political sphere yeah. around the run-up to the Iraq War, war with, with that. A lot of people, yeah. people with, you know, you know, sort of aligned incentives can be getting mm -hmm. things really, really wrong. Um, and one of the nice things about the crowd, if he argues, is that with a, a multiplicity of incentives and, and different sort of um, uh, factors, you don't have quite... If there is one sort of mm -hmm. cascading bias, it is going to affect a broad sort of uh, representative sample of people, yeah. but it may affect a whole ton of people yeah. who are trying to get elected in November. Right. No, the, the, the discussion of the cascade effect is, is, is very good. Um, no, and I, I, it's, it's one of those books where I, I you know, I, it's also easy to read, and I'm presuming the candidates need some lighter yeah, reading. Yeah. Um, and then on, uh, you know, on, on trade, I recommended, you know, for, for McCain, I recommended the Danny Roderick book, One Economics, Many Recipes, and for Obama, I recommended Martin Wolf's book, Why Globalization right. Works, just so they can, you know, get a sense from the other uh, I think, I think Obama and Goolsby. Goolsby's not exactly a trade spirit experience. He's a great, great guy. guy. Uh, he's, uh, not, he's not. Obama's not, Obama's not, not that trade radical. radical. No, 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 I agree. Although, I mean, but, Admittedly, you know, you have to admit, you know, what he said during the campaign hasn't necessarily been comforting for those of us who like free. Yes, you know, no. Uh, the, the, the original been... denunciation of NAFTA is, um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure it's settled you. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, you know, we'll we'll see where where we go on that. Um, oh God, I'm trying to remember the other books I recommended. Uh, um, you have Doris Kearns Goodwin. Oh, right, Team of Rivals, that's right. I feel a little bit guilty recommending a Doris Kearns Goodwin book because I've never quite gotten over that whole right. plagiarism business that, that Goodwin got enmeshed in. But I have to say, Team of Rivals, is, I, I, I don't know, know if you've read it. It's a, it's a, fan, it's a fantastic book um, in terms of just the leadership, that, the, the way in which Lincoln leads, and particularly the fact that this might be the least petty man uh, ever to be president. That I mean, you know, reading that book, it's very clear – all of his cabinet thought they were superior to Lincoln in terms of political qualities, in terms of leadership. They were backbiting. And yet the amazing thing is that Lincoln was somehow able to fuse these people into a, a whole, and not doing it through some sort of apolitical process, but rather, in fact, by being very keenly aware of when it was right to be political. Um, and, so, and so that, I thought, was, uh, was very good. I think one book that I actually forgot to mention on the list, but I would still recommend, would be uh, Virginia Postrel's The Future and Its Enemies. Um, just because it's a great book to sort of point out when it is that you know being a traditional you know when being a traditionalist actually blunts innovation and, and particularly uh, uh, given the the way in which this campaign has sometimes seemed a little too nostalgia filled, it'd be nice to remind people that you know you're voting for someone or you know you're going to be yeah. campaign, uh, governing in the future, not not now. Um, but what about so your? I sort of focused on all the enough sort of political economy and the power of it. Um, my first two because I, I do a lot of healthcare policy work. The system by David Broder, which is yeah. the best TikTok history of the, of the congressional maneuvering around the 1994, it's a bit long, long and it has a bit of like a like like four three problem where you can go into like, like, like what was always Lincoln Shapey doing that morning. There's not a whole <laughs> lot of uh, aggregate analysis of what was happening, you know, in the political environment and the economy and the blah, 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 blah. I mean, all this had a lot of power, but yeah. it really does give you a, a sense of the importance of sort of 
congressional maneuvering and you know yep. what it what it looks like at really the ground level of uh, of a reform that complicated and how many moving parts there are and how many stakeholders there were and and I would pair that with Jacob Hacker who you mentioned earlier his book The Road yep. to Nowhere which is much a, a much slimmer volume than, than Broder it doesn't do so much of the congressional stuff it's much more about construction of the policy, and in that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about Jackson Hole Group and, and so forth that I don't think people really need to read, but, but there, there is really, 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 really wonderful emphasis uh, on, 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 you know, the importance of politics when you're dealing with policy, yeah. that you can't, you know, the Clinton people really try to get a policy compromise among wants in, internal to their administration, right. and said, hey, we, you know, we've satisfied what everybody wanted, but since they didn't bring everybody in at the beginning, nobody felt that way, I mean, you know. So it's really good on, uh, even more so than Broderick, on the need to be involved with Congress at the beginning, need to bring, bring stakeholders in, primacy of political coalitions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I also, I'm, uh-huh. I'm curious. I mean, did Dana Scotchpole write a book on the 94 health crisis? She did. You, did you like that one or not? Just not uh, I, I like it. I like, I like Jacob's better. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I, I'm not attacking Jacob. This is no, no, no. I was just, I, that's the, that's yeah. the third book I remember. And on that, um, so then you go, go to, I have Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational, in that um, as a bit, Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Ariely's book is very, very good at um, sort of dramatizing the ways in which sort of markets can meet with the frailty of the human uh, rational, rationality process, and that can occasionally yeah. and at times systematically end up disadvantaging individuals. And I think you see this in the subprime market where a lot of people that are going to suffer into loans they really could really buy, buy into. And, and um, I, I think it you know, I does, and correctly so, hold a, a very sort of venerated place in our polity. I think it is important for, you know, presidents, particularly who are, are traveling among the rich and the very, very well-informed, to, to remember hmm. how the sort of very slim thread by which our rationality hangs and, and how quickly it can be subverted, how quickly we can lose sight of it. Um, uh, I think it's a healthy book to read politically. I also, which side are you on by Thomas Gagan, which is, I think, the most beautiful book about the labor movement and its importance that we're in, and I'm a big sort of union guy, uh-huh. so uh, that is where that one came from. And I'm trying to remember my final one as well. I'm quickly, well, I don't appear to be connected to the internet right now, so I guess I'm not going to be doing that. Well, we'll put, you know what, we'll we'll put our posts on the, uh, I'm sure the posts, those the two posts will go on the uh on the right hand side, so that you know they can uh, they can check those out. I mean, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Uh, I think Matt Iglesias commented on these things, and he pointed out that you know it was unfair to make politicians read books about public policy. Although I don't know, given this last president, I yeah. I, I kind of think it's a good thing if they read about politics and public policy. Yeah. But I, I, let me we can close with this: if you had to pick one book of fiction for them to read, what would it be? It'd be *Grapes and Wrath* by John Steinbeck. Wow. I I think there's no book more crucial to understanding the sort of the, the role of government and the sort of um, ability of sort of capitalism to individual than that, that book. And it's such a, uh, it's by far, I mean, it's the first book that sort of ever really made me feel like the way Harold Bloom talks about literature. literature. I mean, it really, I mean, it really it really it really and, and not just sort of just in, in, in my, my support by collectivists, you know, but really in just the, the sort of understanding of how you know, really hard-working, decent people are doing everything right. Sim is, at the end of the day, bigger than they are. And the role of government, mm-hmm. one way or the other, whatever sort of uh, objective you want to pursue, the role of government is to give them, give them, them that bit of power, power and they, they, can't, they can't capture it. That, that is why they sort of, why they sort of come together and, and enter into this contract to create a society and a sort of powerful, overarching institution that can do that. Because, you know, on, on our own, we are not, you know, that together we, we can be much more so. And and beyond that, it's a beautiful book. And Steinbeck, I think, has always got in America and, and what makes it great better than any other any other author. Hmm. That's pretty good. Um, I do not have a similar book on the conservative side, I have to confess, because I, I thought about the question, but I, had, I don't have an answer myself. I, I guess the one I would recommend would be uh, James Goldman. Uh, it's a play, The Lion in Winter. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen the movie. There, there was a movie that... Uh, it was a movie version of it in, in '68 with Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn, uh-huh. and then I think it was a cable movie uh, remade recently. But it is a just delicious play of uh, it's about Henry II and his sons and um, his wife Eleanor of Aquitaine and one particular Christmas court where the King of France is invited in, and it's basically all about these people who are politically ambitious, um, desperately trying to maneuver for power, and uh, the ways in which that conflicts with other interpersonal, you know, uh, you know, sort of 
familiar, familial bonds of affection, love, and hate, for that matter. Um, and and it's, it's also just incredibly wittily done. Um, and, and it just, you know, I, I guess in some ways it points out that as, as much as, I guess in contradistinction to you, as much as the, that structural forces might matter in terms of, uh, of governing, that in the end personal relations also matter a fair amount. Um, and that, you know, you better be uh, wise in terms of who you pick in terms of your, uh, your chief of staff, your cabinet secretaries, and so on and so forth, because they can make or break your presidency. Um, well, maybe we can get Amazon to do that little offer them. There we go. Yes. If you <laughs> sign back and the line. You like the grapes of wrath, you'll love the light. <laughs> that would possibly be the first time they're ever combined. Uh, I like that. Well, you know. Right. Well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, Matt Buck is Iglesias uh, uh, in with, paired with Ron Paul. Oh, Heads in the Sand? Yes. That's right. Matt was upset <laughs> no, that neither of us mentioned Heads in the Sand, so we can mention it right here. Uh, you know, of course, he, you know, you could potentially buy Heads in the Sand as well, although I don't think that's a work of fiction, and I'm pretty sure Matt wouldn't want that to be categorized as a work of fiction. No, um, but as a blurber on the back of that, I, I can tell you that it's uh, one of the finest pieces of um, writing and or literature. I, I mean, it makes all this stuff look like guarantee embarrassed. <laughs> I sure me laughing. With it is a very good book. People should buy it. I enjoyed it very much. I, but I like that. That was that was that was an aw that was awesome blurb in there. Right. You know, as the president would have said, awesome blurb. Yes, that, that, was, that was an awesome blurb. Um, all, all right. right. And on that note, uh, Ezra, it was a pleasure. And you, Dan. All right. Take care. Be well.